Good morning, everybody. We'd like to welcome you to the first HLAA, Diablo Valley chapter meeting of the new year. So we see some people who are chatting out here. They're saying hello to their friends. We understand how important that is. We're happy that you were able to complete your conversation. So I'd like to introduce myself for those of you who don't know me. My name is Ann Thomas, and I'm the president of the Hearing Loss Association of America, the Diablo Valley chapter. Yes. Hey, Jim, you need, your mic going to a um, amplifier or being here? Nope, it's going through a hearing loop. So I should have done that first. This room has a hearing loop, which is an assistive listening system that is required by law in places of public accommodation that have public address systems. You need to look for this sign everywhere. Rossmore has the largest number of hearing loops of anywhere in Contra Costa County, maybe in Northern California. We've created a list here for you so that you know which rooms have hearing loops. So if you have a telecoil in your hearing instrument, and I'm using the word instrument because hearing aids, cochlear implants, and bone conductive devices all have telecoils. And rather than saying those three words a million times, we're calling them hearing instruments. If your hearing instrument has a telecoil, all you need to do is press the button on your device, or possibly it might be in a um, auxiliary device like a mini mic, and you will automatically connect to the hearing loop in this room. And how a hearing loop is different than the PA, the effective range of hearing aids is only about six feet. So everybody sitting in this room is further away than six feet from the loudspeakers. So that means you're past the range of the effectiveness of your hearing instrument. The hearing loop takes the sound directly to your hearing instrument. It's like the sound is in the middle of your head. Many of you, if this is your first time attending one of our meetings, may not have any idea whether your hearing instrument has a telecoil or not. And that's because unfortunately, most audiologists don't tell their patients about that. So we have a card right here. This was created so that you didn't really have to worry about what to say. Because based on our experience, we found that it was really confusing to many of the consumers. So we created a card for you that explains to your audiologist everything that you would like to know about your instrument. It says, Audiologist and hearing aid provider, please advise me if my hearing instruments have telecoils. If they do, please activate and program them for a hearing loop. On the back, we've left space for them to write in for you so that you know how to find that. So most hearing instruments have the ability of having multiple programs. So, you know, if you don't know what program your telecoil is, it's problematic. You're pressing the buttons, you don't know what's happening. So this potentially could say the third program, the third beep, the second beep depends on where it is. And it's written there for you. So when you leave their office, you don't have to really think about, oh no, what did they say to me? I didn't really quite understand them because you can look at your card. So if there's anybody here who would like some more information about that, please talk to me later. When we use a hearing loop, every single person needs to talk through a microphone. And so we'll have people who are runners. So I introduced myself as Ann Thomas. This is Alan Katsura, our tech person, all around 
person who helps with everything. This is Zohar Chiba, our vice president. And Alan wants to say something to me, just not need to raise or tilt your um, screen. Yeah, that good. That's better. Thank you. See, so you need additional helpers because I can't look behind me and, and look ahead of me as well. So I saw um, a woman right there who has her hand raised. So Zohar, this microphone, Zohar, the microphone right there, you're going to have to turn it on. So press the, no, it's on the side. Press the button. And how we explain to people to use a microphone with a T-coil. It's not like on television where you see it's down here. Those microphones cost thousands and thousands of dollars. Pretend it's like an ice cream cone that you're gonna lick. So it's right about here and you hold it just below your lips so people could lip read. What did you want to know? Hi, yes, I was just trying to inform you that the video is not showing you. It is showing your chest mainly. And um, is the camera only on the computer? So the camera here is for people who are zooming in. Okay, so all of you can see me but you need to look here to see the captions. Okay. So Alan came by to tell me that it wasn't positioned very well. And you know, I'm a really um, effervescent person. It's hard for me to stay really still. Okay, and so the camera on my laptop is what's getting me. Okay, and so if that's distracting, I'm sorry. Um, this is only our second hybrid meeting. We feel grateful beyond the moon that everybody's, we think hearing on Zoom and all of you are hearing in this room as well. And we should be able to hear them too. It's really a feat that we were able to accomplish this. So if something happens, see when I turn around, that looks really weird, right? So just let me know what's happening out here if I need to do something so it looks better or it's more appealing to you. Okay, so Kathy, did I say everything that I needed to say at the beginning? Yeah, okay, thank you. And thank you for reminding me. So most people don't realize yeah. that Hearing loss is a disability covered under a variety of federal, state, and local laws. So the symbol that you need to look for, this symbol on the top without a T, is the generic symbol that indicates that there is um, an assistive listening system in the room. If there is the symbol with the T, and can everybody see it? It's this one here and everybody on Zoom. That means that there's a hearing loop. Now it's very confusing to people frequently because the T stands for telecoil. So sometimes and the telecoil is actually in your hearing instrument. It's not in the hearing loop. So what's in the room is a hearing loop. So all technologies need to be available. Uh huh. What is, there are two pictures there. One has a T and one doesn't. What, one that doesn't, what does that signify? Okay, so the ADA man, uh, standards have uh, specifications for assistive listening systems. There are three kinds of assistive listening systems one is an FM, which is radio frequency. It's just like your FM radio, but they've designated a certain frequency for assistive listening systems. The other one is an infrared, and an infrared is line of sight. And you might be familiar with that because most of your remote control guns are infrared. Okay. Both FM and infrared every single person is required to get a receiver. And if you had a telecoil in your hearing instrument, you would use a neck loop with that receiver. One of the things that makes hearing loops so wonderful for all of us is if you have a telecoil, you don't need anything. You walk into the space, you press the button on your hearing instrument or you use your remote control 
um, which is on your smartphone frequently today, and go to the Telequail program, you're all set. For the other things, most venues require you to either leave your driver's license or they have a whole myriad of things. Not only do you have to remember to go get it and identify yourself and make a big deal, you have to remember to turn it back in to get your driver's license. It's so easy to forget that. Yes, ma'am. Uh, do all the hearing aids include the telecoil function? All hearing aids do not have the telecoil function. You need to make sure to ask for one. Okay. So everybody needs telecoils and Bluetooth. Bluetooth is at this point in time, it's one to one. An expanded version of Bluetooth is on the horizon for most of us with hearing loss. We're probably not going to see the benefits of that for probably 10 years. And the reason for that is we only buy hearing aids every five years. So by the time there's a critical mass of us, then it's going to be 10 years. Um, so that's the Kathy, you asked about the three systems. So those are the three systems. So for the hearing loop, you don't have to identify yourself. You don't have to do anything. You, you personally don't have to worry about whether they charge the batteries. I can't tell you how many times I've ever used an FM system. And I'm very knowledgeable about technology. I'm not ashamed of my hearing loss. I self-identify everywhere I go. I call three, four times ahead of time to make sure the batteries are charged in the devices. And here I'm gonna play, I'm at something, and right at the, the most important part of why I went to whatever location I did, whether it was a play or a meeting or a lecture, the battery dies. So you don't have any of those problems with the hearing. Does that answer your question? Um, oh, wait a minute, Zohair. I'm, I'm talking to you, see, and I can understand how during the pandemic, I got two cochlear implants, two very successful cochlear implants. So I'm hearing better than I've heard in 20 years. And so I keep forgetting. Yeah, I wanted that to be passed around. I, it, it needs to be passed and be passed. Would you like to help? I couldn't hear that lady over there. Uh -huh. Yeah, so can you continue with what you were saying? That's all. <laughs> that, that was all. I was just asking that the mic be given to people when in the audience. Everybody in the audience to be heard has to speak into the microphone. So we, Zohair is the designated runner. If, if he, Zohair could take this side because we have two microphones. Would you like to distribute them on this side? Would you like to be a runner on this side? Otherwise, you just have to wait till Zohair gets to you. Okay, so everybody has to speak through a microphone. So is there any other question right now before we move on to what our program may or may not be here about um, our book discussion? So everybody's good, okay, so. Sherry Eberts and Gail Hannon have written this, what I consider to be the seminal book on hearing loss and, okay, is that good? Hearing loss and how to create your best life with it. Hearing loss affects all parts of your life, physically, emotionally, socially, and especially with your relationships with other people. And your audiologist probably is not giving you the assistance that you need to be able to function well with all of the things going on about that. And that's why the Hearing Loss Association of America was formed in 1984 to help all of us with those things. I know that my life would have been radically, radically different if I hadn't found HLAA in 2009 um, I might have been a cloistered person. I can understand how that happens to people. It can be very painful to be in a room, even at a close range with somebody, and absolutely not understand them, even with your best devices. So with all of us, we're all in the same boat. 
You don't have to say, I'm sorry because I can't understand. You don't have to make excuses. You don't have to feel bad because all of us know what that's like. For those of you who are here with your mates, frequently before people start coming to HLAA, they, didn't, they don't realize what they need to tell their mates so that they can understand well in a variety of situations. And the biggest one of all is, please face me. As I said, if the effective range of hearing aids is only about six feet, that's not very far. It's I put my arm out, a person there puts their arm out, that's six feet, that's not very far. Theoretically, if I was standing on this side and this is an information table and you're standing over there, if you have more than a mild to moderate hearing loss, there's a great likelihood that you won't be able to understand. So with your mates, you need to tell them, if you're not facing me, I can't understand you. You need to face me also so I can lip read. So before this book by um, Sherry and Yale, there was really no documented information all in one place. Both of them are my friends, my fellow advocates. I know them personally. Um, uh, Sherry lives in New York and Gail lives in uh, Canada. And we all get together at the HLA convention every year. So they gave a present, they gave a presentation about their book at our last chapter meeting. And if you weren't able to attend that meeting, we have a YouTube channel. And you can watch all of our previous meetings on our YouTube channel. Now, originally at the beginning of the pandemic, we started including all of the directions for Zoom, which eventually I'm gonna to get to in this presentation for people who are participating in Zoom on the other side, all over the United States, which is the wonderful golden uh, silver lining of the pandemic that that venue has been created for us. So at that time, before our last meeting, we asked everybody if they would like to have a book discussion for this meeting. And the majority of people said yes. But I would like to know in this room, can you please just raise your hand how many people have actually read the book? Okay, so the majority of people in this room haven't read the book, which is perfectly fine because in my mind, when I was thinking about this meeting, I was thinking about how could we orchestrate it so that it wasn't limited to just the book. There are lots of things though in the book club discussion that we all can relate to. So we printed out the list of the um, book club questions. Does everybody have one? So far, nobody has. I, I... I forgot to hand them out. Well, that's okay. It's nice to receive something from somebody. Okay, while Zohar is handing those out, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And I'm going to go ahead and After I got the hand we already talked about. So now we're going to go ahead and move toward why everybody may have come to this meeting today. So I think because we have more people who haven't read the book, then maybe we should go around and just quickly say, what drew you to come to this meeting if you haven't already read the book? And why don't we start over here? And welcome. I just wanted to hear um, what the book is about. Perfect, thank you. Arlene. I partially read the book and I, it's wonderful. I'm Walt Bateman. I came to the meeting to see him. <laughs> Thanks, Walt. Um, I attended many of the meetings prior to the pandemic. This is the first time back. And primarily because I am very unhappy with the hearing aids I have now that are probably less than a year old. And so I just need to find the foundation. Thank you. 
Make sure that we're going to get together after our meeting. I am always open to talk to people. Maybe they just need to be adjusted. There. I'm Cindy, and I've come to the meeting because I felt like there must be help out there, um, more help, help that I didn't realize, devices I've never heard of, and people who are experiencing life like I am that I could connect with. Perfect. Thank you. We're happy you're here. Hi, my name is Catherine. I am new to Ross Ward. Uh, I just learned about this group, and I'm very interested in uh, becoming a part of it. I do have a career in it. I'm Kathy. Um, I belong to HLAA in, in different cities all over um, before I moved here to Walnut Creek. I have a cochlear implant and a hearing aid, and I still struggle, especially um, in rooms with a lot of background noise. Thank you. Yeah, before you say something, I just want to let you know, many, many, many of our chapter members have cochlear implants. And I think that I know personally over 10 people who've gotten implants um, since the pandemic started. So since they, um, in two years ago, they lowered the criteria for Medicare for cochlear implants. So lots of people who previously weren't um, flocking to get them are now doing so. Go ahead. Oh, wait a minute, one hand here. I just wanted to respond to that quickly because I got mine during the pandemic 21. And then Zoom did not have closed caption as an option, which I use for training, for retraining my brain. And at that time, I had used Google.com, and that worked perfectly fine. So it's interesting how Zoom has progressed in that respect. Yeah. So Zoom actually had captions for a lot longer than you actually were aware of, but it was only if you had a professional account. No, I did not. And, and so when they, then they opened it up after that to, if you were a person with hearing loss and you didn't have a professional account, if you wrote them a note, then they activated it for you. But so that's long over, right? Go ahead, it's your turn now. Yes, I'm Rita and I have severe hearing problems and I come because I feel that uh, I may get some insights into what I can do to improve my hearing. Thank you. Uh, I've never had a hearing aid and uh, I'm about to buy my first because from my own experience, and uh, also from the hearing test, I know I can use one in certain situations. So I'm very glad to have learned about the, uh, the telefoil and the, uh, that system uh, in the rooms, in many of the rooms, and lots going on. And, and I try to use that. Yeah, something that um, we didn't really go into, and I don't know, I must have gotten sidetracked. So all of the devices, the assistive listening systems, have to be accessible to people with no hearing instrument, people with a hearing instrument, no telecoil, and hearing aid compatible. Meaning if you have a telecoil and it's a hearing loop, that's a no-brainer. If it's an FM or an infrared, you get a neck loop instead of headphones for a connector. And we have receivers to give out to people who might not have a telecoil in their hearing device. Is there anybody here who would like to try a receiver who doesn't have a telecoil? Here's one. And if you're a Rossmore resident, Rossmore distributes receivers to you. You need to go to Custodial, which is in the building with Fireside, right? Administration, I think. Okay. And originally they were giving them to residents for three months at a time. It may be longer than that now. They thought that that was much easier than um, at every single meeting to distribute them. Now we have them because 
I couldn't host a meeting without providing accessibility to everybody. So what it is, is it's a box about the size of a cigarette, old cigarette packet, and that receives the hearing loop signal. There's a port on this box that you plug, if you don't have a teleco, you plug a hearing uh, headphone into that, and then you would wear a headphone, and that's coming here. Okay, so while Zoe here is doing that, yes, please. Yes, I'm Carol, I'm happy to hear about some of these devices. I do have a liquidity and then I need help. I can't hear, and absolutely it is affected my life in lots of ways. Yeah. Excuse me, do you have hearing aids? I do. Okay, so perfect. So please contact me later. Maybe I can maybe there are things that are available to you within your current hearing aid, instruments, hearing aids that you don't know about. We can talk about that. I'm always open to everybody. Where is the box? Right on the other side of the table. I think it's on the floor. I'm telling you, putting all these things together to bring over here. It's like, I thought, oh my gosh, how do I even remember all these things? So all of these receivers, you have to remember to plug them all in because they're all rechargeable batteries. Yeah. I don't have a hearing aid to use that. No. So if I, I don't have a hearing aid. So if I go into the fire, so if I go into the fireside room, which has that logo, I could use one of these and hear uh, the, the uh, lecture better than not. We created a document for everybody in Rossmore that lists the rooms with hearing loops. So this applies everywhere. You can try a receiver here and a headphone, and Zohair will get to you shortly. You're like, what? Well, I'm Cherry, and uh, we belong to this organization, even though we lived on Long Beach. Uh, when I came here, my hearing was really deteriorating. And uh, when we went to a couple of Zoom meetings and got to talk here and talk about our experiences. And through, through the one year that we've been here, we can move from our COVID implant. And um, it's Changed my whole entire life, and I really appreciate it. Thank you. I'm her husband, Lynn, and uh, this is the boy. I just came to support her, but I have hearing loss as well. My name is Elaine. I have um, severe hearing loss. I have hearing aids, and I find the hearing aids are not performing, and I wonder whether it's the hearing aid or my own hearing that has deteriorated. And so I have to determine that. I have scheduled uh, a new uh, audiologist that I've never seen before. And I'm hoping that he can clarify that and be of help to me. I'm Gloria. I am suffering from some hearing loss. I currently have no device at all. Uh, one of I think one of my biggest issues for not hearing is the tinnitus that just drives me crazy some days. So I am looking for information on how I can address those problems. The woman who was sitting next to you and everybody else, we for a very long time have had this as part of our teaching tools. And I don't know if they can see this on yeah, you can see that now, um, as a teaching tool. So what happens is that all of us go to our audiologist, right? And we have a hearing test, and the results of those tests are accorded on a document that's called an audiogram. I encourage everybody to always take, ask for their audiogram, because over time, this allows you to be able to track your own hearing, your hearing loss, what's going on with that. Also, when somebody says to you, oh, you have mild to moderate hearing loss, 
you don't have any idea what that means. So it's not adequately explained to people in a way that they can really understand what that means. So we use this form. And what I encourage people to do is to take their audiogram and mark directly on here, these are the frequencies and this is the volume. So you mark on here exactly what was on your personal audiogram. And then you're able to look at this document and on the side, you can see, okay, so from zero to um, 20 decibels is considered normal. So if you don't have anything in there, there's no doubt in your mind you don't have normal hearing, right? So, if, and the most common hearing loss that's age-related is high frequency. So the chances are really great that people in this room have high frequency hearing loss, and that's in this area here. And depending on what your personal audiogram says, when you mark it on here, you can see exactly what kind of hearing loss you have and what you can understand. So this is called the speech banana. That's where all the consonants and the sounds are. So for the high frequency sounds, the things that you can't hear are K, T, F, S, and T, H. Well, those are lots of words that really um, designates a lot of the parts of speech. So if you took your audiogram and you marked on here what was going on, you would have a good idea about, oh, what level of hearing loss do I have? Oh, it's moved into the severe to profound range. So there's a rule of thumb, and it's that when you're, the volume is at around 70 decibels, you're helped really well by hearing aids. As your hearing continues to progress past that, what happens is you have hair cells and the hair cells die. So it doesn't make any difference how much additional volume you give to them you can't make them stand up and be good soldiers so that they can understand. So what you're looking at for most of us is balancing out how long to keep your hearing aids before you think about looking at another option, which would be a cochlear implant. So when you're no longer benefit well from your hearing aids, then it's time to explore a cochlear implant. And so that you know, different than hearing instruments, and although in our county, um, our health insurance is all starting to include hearing um, aids um, for the senior advantage plans, but all Medicare programs actually cover uh, cochlear implants. Yes. There's a question here. Uh -huh. you have oh, okay. oh, you're just loving the mic. Yeah. Uh, my name is Tina, and I'm here. I've had hearing aids for 12, 15 years. My husband's had them for 15, 20 years. Now it's cochlear implants. And after four months, I am very frustrated with this cochlear implant. So I'd love to talk to you after the meeting also. Hi, I'm Leslie, and I'm here to um, find out um, ways to be a better neighbor to uh, my friend. That's really lovely of you. So the biggest thing for you to remember, oh, and above the board, just make sure you're facing her. Because if you're not, there's very little chance probably that she's going to be able to understand you. And today we may talk about some other technologies because it's actually part of the book. Um, one of the things that is really wonderful if you have a smartphone is there speech to text apps now? During the pandemic, I don't know what I would have done without that. So I would take my smartphone, turn on my speech to text app, and let's see if I can get it up here. My favorite. This is cool. 
Okay, so I would so I would turn on my app and I would start talking. And so you're in the grocery store, you can't understand the checker. So I would the microphone is at the top. I would reach out so the microphone was closer to the checker and it would caption everything that person said. Yeah. I can you need the microphone. Yeah. You need to put your telephone in front of the computer so we can see it. We can't see you, but your telephone, right? Can't see. Well, so you can see my telephone and you can see the captions on it. Oh, here. Let me see. Oh, wait a minute. There you go. Does that help? Yeah. That's what you meant. Okay, and with this particular one, you can make the, you can spread the captions. And so apps like that are a lifesaver. We have captioned telephone call services also that are apps, and that's different than a speech-to-text app. So if somebody would call you, it could go directly by forwarding the call to your smartphone to one of the programs. Two of the most popular ones are Eno Caption and Olelo, and both of them forward. So when the phone, and since I have my cochlear implants, my whole language around hearing loss has changed. So I was realizing when I was engaging with people, how could I explain to them in a way that they could understand that sometimes you're with me and I can understand every single thing. I don't have any issues. And then one other person comes into the conversation and they have an accent or they don't articulate well. So what I started saying is, and it applies to all of us, People with hearing loss live hearing loss live uncertain lives. We never know when we're going to be able to hear and understand and when we won't. So you need to be prepared and make sure to ask for the accommodations that you need beforehand. Because if you don't and you get to a situation that you're going to and you can't understand, then it's too late to get the accommodation. So you need to look at her. I don't know what things that you're using and telling people if you couldn't um, understand somebody, did you know beforehand to say, oh, could you please face me so I can read your lips? Can you please hand her the microphone? Yes, I need that. Perfect. And so you're just you're just being this wonderful, nice person. You don't want, and I can't see your name from here. And if I leave, somebody's gonna tell me they can't see me on there. Um, so that she doesn't have to tell you that to make things easier. That's really wonderful. We have trouble communicating by either the cell phone, which does it does have the program for closed captions or that might be the wrong right term. Um, but she also has a telephone that has a screen that also. But it doesn't always work for how I communicate with her or, or try to handle plans that we're trying to make. And lucky enough, I live close enough that it's a short walk. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm often walking over there too. Make plans. Okay, so from my personal experience, when my hearing got profound, I pretty much quit using the telephone. And texting became my good friend. So if there was something I wanted to know, I was texting somebody about something and didn't really have those lengthy conversations that I had beforehand that I can now have. For me, it's like all it's like, you know, I'm a kid in a candy store. Um, now, on the telephones, there are landline telephones that can have captions, and some of them are better than others. And it depends on how long you've had your phone. Um, you might want to think about upgrading the phone. Another thing you might want to think about doing is, you know, with all technology that we have. Lots of it is basically a binary system, which means that it's 
the coating is either on or it's off. Well, after you're using it for a long time, sometimes it can't read those things very well. So the common thing for everybody to know about is to reset your device. Doesn't matter whether it's your phone using the internet, whether it's your smartphone, whether it's your iPad, tablet, laptop, or computer. And to reset it means either you restart it or for your phone, unplug it, usually let it sit for a minute and then plug it back in. And lots of times that clears out glitches that may happen in the phone. So I'm understanding that you're using a landline telephone with captions. Uh, we're using cell phones to try to text each other. Well, do you have a um, app on the cell phone so that when somebody uh, that captions, so they're the two um, ones that most people like the best are Inu caption and Olelo. And so when somebody calls me, generally I'm connected via Bluetooth to my phone. And most of the time I can understand everybody. See, I'm never sure. And so I always have them go through my caption telephone and it's captioning everything that everybody says. And I think that the captions on my cell phone are better than the captions on my landline phone. So are you using an app with captions on your smartphones? Uh, oh, so let's, let's work on that. Let's have the, um, after this meeting, um, contact me and either I'll come over here or um, we can meet someplace else, the library in Walnut Creek, we'll set that up for you. And then you can see how that works. Okay. Now, something that I'd like to mention to you as the friend, hearing loss is not just the physical ability of not being able to hear that sound any longer. It also takes longer to process the sound and it's exhausting. So it's a reminder to everybody that you just need to talk a little slower, a little bit louder and a little slower. Don't shout at people because then your mouth distorts. Okay, and so, so then you can't read lips, so then you're stuck. Um, you mentioned uh, a speech app. Okay, so you need to take that microphone and look at me, tilt it oh, towards you and right. then drop it a little there. Perfect. Okay, uh, you mentioned a speech app that you use on your cell phone. Which app do you use? I happen to use AVA, A V A. A V A. Mm -hmm. But there are, there are many apps. Um, the reason I use Ava is because I know all of the founders of the company. They um, were two, three people from UC Berkeley. I know them when they graduated, when they were developing this app. And um, the person whose idea it was comes from a family where everybody's deaf. And he's called what's a coda, which means a child of a deaf adult. And he... His whole life, he was always their interpreter, and he's French. And he likens the likelihood that he, it, that it's greater, the likelihood is greater that he would have been struck by lightning than that he can hear in his family. Nobody has ever heard. And so he wanted to direct his find wonderful intellect toward helping his family and all of us and Ava was born. Today of all of the um, speech to text apps, it is the most robust. So it works on your smartphone, it works on your tablet, it works on your computer and something that it does, which is different than all of the other apps is it allows multiple people to connect to the same conversation at the same time. And so what that means is, especially during the pandemic, where we had to have six foot distance, right? So all of a sudden, none of us could hear because it's past six feet, then you, have a, then you have a mask. So if Kathy, you had Ava on your phone, 
and I had Ava on my phone, it doesn't matter where we are, it shows up as two separate icons are where individual people having full conversations. So you can have conversation over distance, which you can't do with anything else. So that's why, so some of the other ones are Otter. Um, I just gave a presentation to HLA Albuquerque on using your smartphone. There's another one called Simply Something that somebody else preferred. Um, and if anybody's interested in that and want to learn how to put that on your phone, just contact me. We'll figure out what works for you and just keep moving forward. Yeah. So is there another question out there? Yeah. Does O'Hare? Um, I think um, somebody's trying to give you the microphone back. No. So this started with the audiogram that started in the back. So what might happen for you is that if you, oh, and if you didn't ask for your audiograms before, lots of people don't think about that. If you're going to the same person, tell them you'd like a copy of your last three audiograms. And they have to give it to you if you ask for them. You know who the person is and you're not seeing them, still ask, ask for that. Tell them you'd like to track for their not. So if you're looking there and you're seeing all of a sudden, hey, these major sounds are all down in here. It's time to think about something else because more than likely you're not benefiting from your hearing instrument and can't. I'd like to know if there's anything you can do about an age-related hearing loss, I've been asked to see an MD, and I've been told there's nothing they can do, so you don't need to see an MD. I thought maybe there was some help I could get so it doesn't just get worse, or maybe there's something wrong, or is this just the way it is? Okay, so that's a really, really great question. And how what I'm hearing is, what's the best way? What's the golden golden rule about how to engage with your hearing loss? So there are two types of people, two categories of people that can prescribe hearing instruments. One is an audiologist, and they have the largest amount of training. And in the state of California, you have to have a doctorate in audiology today. Now you may run into some people who still have a master's, and that's because they were grandfathered in when the law changed, it didn't require them to update. So the audiologist, the hearing health care, oh, excuse me, and then you have a hearing aid provider. And a hearing aid provider does not have the same training as an audiologist but they're licensed by the state of California to be able to sell hearing instruments. So the rule of thumb generally is, you notice you have a hearing loss and you go and have your hearing tested. You also then would go to an ENT. And the reason you go to an ENT is to make sure that there's nothing else going on. So they'll look in your ears, you'll have the conversation with them. And they're much more, the NT really knows about the structural things. So in their language, when they specialize in, in actually ears is otolaryngologist. Okay, so in, in your situation, have you been to see an audiologist? Yes. Okay, so the audiologist said, oh, you have hearing loss. And the solution we have for you is hearing aids. He also said it's getting worse fast. Okay, so in this place, see where I'm talking about being able to track what's happening to you? So this is a nebulous place. So who? how do we believe what somebody says is fast? So potentially you could have a progressive hearing loss that's changing really fast. 
And I'm sorry that that would be happening to you, but you know, it is what it is. And at this point in time, no one knows how to regenerate hair cells. We don't know how to do anything to, quote, repair our physiology. So the technology that's available to you, and I'm, I don't know right now, but there is conductive hearing loss, and then there is central neural hearing loss. And there could be a degenerative malformation of your ear, which is a whole other thing. And there's also a disorder where you have a tumor. Okay, so if you were having something out of the ordinary, it's time for you to see an EMT. Doesn't that make sense? They just yeah, Zohair, you want to give her the microphone a minute because she's still um yeah. You're... I think you said C and T, but they don't have it allowed me to, so I need to insist. Um when you say allow, the, the, what kind of like what... HMO. The, when I go to the EMT office, there's a nurse there that looks at me. And when I said, I don't want to see you, I want to see a doctor, she always says, you just have it. No, you don't see doctors, you just see me. So she looks at my ears and cleans it out. I have something wrong that's growing into the, my earwax is growing into the bone. And I don't know why. She doesn't seem to know why. Um, you know what? Let's talk about this afterwards. All right. Um, yeah, so I don't know. Because it really depends on which HMO you have, what's happening. And you're always entitled with all Medicare to get a second opinion. Okay, so everybody needs to remember that. You can get a second opinion. Okay, and so I don't know who you have or yeah. what. And, and I, after we talk privately, I probably can give you some more input. Yes, thank you. Okay. Yeah, so here. And uh, if you if you have otosclerosis, then an ENT can help you actually with uh, with an operation, a small operation, to restore the conductive hearing loss. But the ENT will determine whether you have a conductive hearing loss or there's something wrong with the cochlea. So I'm going to make a jump here that maybe there are people in this room who don't really know what the difference between what oh, uh, Zohar is talking about and your cochlea. And I don't have a slide here, but I can probably demonstrate with my hands. So you have, oops, the outside part of your ear, which we all see, right? Then it goes and you have your eardrum. So behind the eardrum, before you go into the space that has the cochlea, which would be the inner ear, you have what's called the middle ear. And the middle ear has little bones in them. And the bones go like this. And what they do is they help propel the sound forward to the inner ear. Well, you can, and if you have a problem in this middle ear, it's called a conductive problem. So see, the sound is not being able to conduct, be conducted further into the inner ear. And frequently what happens in that middle ear is that the bones calcify. So when they calcify, they're hard, they can't vibrate, they can't, there's a little place called a stirrup and it does, you know, basically it, it's like a little hammer, it sends the, the things forward. And so Zohair was, two years ago you got that? Yeah, so Zohair, in addition to having a um, sensorial neural hearing loss, also had a conductive hearing loss. And the name of the surgery, if you have a conductive hearing loss with otosclerosis, 
is called a stateectomy. And what they do is they, they give you little, the middle, little metal components, right? To replace the calcified bones. Yeah. And can you tell people how successful that was for you? Yes. Who has the microphone? I, I just want to ask a really quick question. What does ENT stand for? Oh, ear, nose, and throat. Ear, nose, and throat. Thank you. And the specialty for ENT, for ear, nose, and throat, that is focused on hearing is otolaryngologist. So I have both. I, I, I have a problem in my cochlea and I also had a problem with otosclerosis. So with my operation, uh, now I can hear part of the sounds, the lower frequency sounds. I still have problems with higher frequencies. And of course, I use hearing aids. But my hearing has improved dramatically after the operation. But otosclerosis is not sensual neural hearing loss related to aging. Okay. Okay, so. Does anybody have another question, something they want to say right now? Oh, can I just ask you a question? Yeah. Oh, it's a lot. Yeah, it's a question. But you said it's not age related. Does that mean it's a genetic problem? Sensual neural hearing loss is the single most common hearing loss associated with aging. But in case of Zohar. No, Zohar had two. He had sensual neural hearing loss and otosclerosis. So when they, fi when they fixed the otosclerosis with a prosthesis, it allowed more sound to be transmitted, conducted to the inner ear. The, yeah, the inner ear. But otosclerosis is genetic. Uh, many people in my family have this issue. Oh. And apparently where I come from, South Asia, it's very common. Okay. So I want everybody to know that we are really, really fortunate to live in a wonderful progressive state called California. And we have California Connect, which ensures that all people who have the disability of hearing loss and poor other disorders as well, can use the telephone the best as possible, and you're entitled to a free telephone from this free amplified or captioned telephone from the state. Now, all states do not have that. And as part of that program, connected to that program, the California Relay Service, that's what we get our captions, the live captions here today through. So it's something to be really, um, feel grateful for about our tax dollars. Now, in addition to the um, telephones, you're entitled to an accessory of each kind that they have. And one that I really would like to bring to everybody's attention is everybody who has hearing loss needs to know that in an emergency, fire, carbon monoxide, the chances are slim you will get out in enough time to save your life. So the reason is it's so hard to imagine that that shrill, awful sound that you can remember potentially when you could hear better than what you're hearing now, that you cannot hear that in enough time and quickly enough to save yourself. Now, I know that one of the things that many of us might do, right, is stand right under the smoke detector and you press it. Oh, I can still hear that. I mean, I've done all these things so I can tell you that I'm thinking that I'm not that different than the rest of you. The reality is 
you're sleeping at night, you're taking a nap in the afternoon, you have your instruments out, you have a pillow. The pillow covers your head. Okay, so how would how would you be alerted? So one of the devices that the state has is it's a hub. It's called um, what, what's the first word? Aware, something aware. Sonic alarm. alarm. Thank you. And it's a hub, and they provide that from the state because you can plug your telephone in, and if the telephone rang in the middle of the night, it would flash this device. But this device also has accessories. And one of the accessories is for smoke and carbon monoxide detector. So I got my uh, Sonic Aware from the state. And then I purchased, I think for $99, the accessory item for smoke and carbon monoxide alerting. And how this works is it's plugged into the device. And it's not only smoke and carbon monoxide. The first time this happened, I thought, oh, this is weird. But now I'm just, any time it hears unusual sound, it flashes and says alert. So that made me feel great. So if I run my vacuum cleaner in my bedroom, it's going alert, alert, alert. So I I know that it's it's working and you can feel pretty good about it. Kathy. Yeah, I don't know about that. So we have, as part of our outreach, oh, where are they? Um, no, here it is. A driving force from our chapter members and from people who we would talk to in the community when people would ask things. We developed additional brochures. One of them is ask for communication access when you're out. Excuse me. Another one is safety for carbon monoxide and uh, smoke. And every year in September, I give a presentation on emergency planning for people with um, hearing loss. So please feel free to take these brochures because there's information in there for you. Kathy. I'm sorry, I have a home aware. Um, I bought it myself, I didn't know you'd get one free. And the lights that wake me up, so I bought the um, accessory that fits into the pillowcase that vibrates. So everything vibrates when the carbon monoxide or the smoke or my alarm goes off. Yeah, well, so the one with the state, that's this piece that Kathy's talking about. They have this really funny name, you know, sometimes it's really even hard to say it. It's called a bed shaker. And so what it is, is it's a little puck, like a little hockey puck here. And the one from the state that's free comes with the bed shaker. And that bed shaker happens to be the most um, stringent. I mean, it really shakes. Some of them aren't the same. Yeah. Um, do you get this free one from the state using the California Access Program? No, it's called, it used to be called California Telephone Access Program. The acronym was CTAP. Mm -hmm. They changed names and rebranded. It's now called California Connect. And to become certified, it has to be done by, you know, like five different people. Your primary care physician, your audiologist, you know, like four or five things, they certify, yes, you have hearing loss, you send in your form. And once you're certified, you can actually have them send things to your house. Now, I personally like to go there. We have an office in Berkeley. And when I was trying out originally, when I had maybe moderate hearing loss, um, you can, all the phones aren't for the same level of hearing loss. So you could try the devices to find out which one worked the best for you. So you're entitled to this device, you're entitled to a neck loop, um, and the neck loops are either a regular neck loop or a Bluetooth neck loop. Everybody needs a neck loop, um, especially if you have a T-coil in your hearing device. Yeah. What do you do? If you have hearing aids or cochlear implant, what do you do with the neck loop around your neck? So let's say you went to Berkeley Rep and they had FM receivers to give you and they didn't have a neck loop. 
if you had your own neck loop, you could, it's okay. Oh, I'm gonna take one of these one. So all of the receivers are pretty similar. I mean, basically it's a box, right? And they all have ports. So what you would do is, and in this case, people, because this is for a hearing loop, everybody who has a telecoil doesn't need to plug a neck loop into here because they just activate their telecoil. If you use an FM, everybody needs a connector. So rather than plugging in a headphone here, if you plugged in the neck loop there and turned on the telecoil in your hearing, instrument, it would stream directly to your hearing instrument. Does that make sense to you? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Okay. Another reason to have a neck loop is an emergency. You know, if we're in an earthquake, we're in a fire, and you can't go to your house, and you're in some facility and everything, and um, the, the chances are they may have some kind of additional communication access for you. Could be a pocket talker, but they might not have a neck loop. So everybody needs a neck loop in your to-go bag. You just need to have one. It's okay. When I'm, when I'm uh, buying my tickets to the Berkeley Rep, do I just show up for it and ask for one of those things? Or do I tell them somehow ahead of time, I will be coming and will need it? Okay, so I'm a dyed in the wool advocate. This is for everybody who wants to join me. These were what we made last year. I sit on the National Get in the Hearing Loop Committee. I would like things to be better in Contra Costa County. I would like things to be better in Alameda County. Berkeley Rep is not so straightforward about what their requirements really are, and it should be easier. If I were in your shoes, I would call up the ticket office. So sometimes they say, first come, first serve. Somebody said, first come, first serve to me. I don't want to pay for a ticket and not be able to hear. Tell them that. I mean, it's not, it's not about um, being reserved because you're going to end up being the last person on the totem pole. And they say, oh, well, would you like for me to come to this event? I can't attend this event unless and be able to understand unless I can do this. If they have something first come, first serve, say, oh, well, good. Can you make an exception for me? And then after you've enjoyed what you did, then we could direct time if there were people who were interested in specific venues, improving their accessibility for people with hearing loss. So on their website, they should have, and I'm not saying they do, what's available. Okay. So we're getting close to the bewitching hour here. And I just like to to um uh, and, uh -huh. but but some places if you ask them in advance, uh, they do a bang up job in uh, providing you uh, with a uh, with accommodation. So be sure to ask. <laughs> So next month, we're having a very special uh, presenter. And he's a medical student in otolaryngology from UCSF. And he's conducting a research project on new algorithms for advanced bionics cochlear implants. And they're looking for participants who would like to participate research study and I've already signed up so I'm, I have advanced bionic hearing aids and you know I'm a really curious I want to help everybody else as much as I can as well as myself and so this is called a hackathon 
And so it, what it amounts to is you're going to have one day where you would spend with him and he's going to try and make other adjustments and regular and um, then gauge how well you could possibly hear in music. Did this improve your ability for music and so forth? And I believe they're paying a $200 stipend. And so after our meeting today, I'll send out the um, flyer for that for all of you. So he's gonna come and um, talk to us about that. And even though you may not have a cochlear implant or you may even have a different uh, manufacturer's implant, I think it's really valuable for all of us to realize all the work that goes on behind the scenes to make improvements for all of us going forward. So we have that next month. And um, in May, we're hoping to be able to have um, one of our chapter members who's written a book. Her book is supposed to be released in June. So we're kind of fence-sitting about, we committed to May and we don't know whether it would be better if we had her give the presentation after her book is released or right before. We have the HLAA convention, um, which is in June. And this year we're fortunate enough that it's gonna be in Phoenix. So we're not having to pay, you know, like $800 for our airplane ticket to go back east or somewhere else. So this past year it was um, in uh, New Orleans. Well, we have no direct flights to New Orleans. You know, so it's nice to look at a Southwest airline ticket for a couple hundred bucks instead of 700 bucks. Um, in May this year, we're having our walk for hearing. And if you haven't come, I'd really love for you to join us. There are hundreds of people throughout. We have three very active chapters in Northern California. One is in Marin, and it's called the North Bay chapter. One is the East Bay chapter, which is in Oakland, and the Peninsula chapter that's on the peninsula. And all of us come together and have a huge walk. And so I believe this year it's, and I have a slide, I, my, my slides don't want to advance right now. I don't really know why. Um, so then I can't get out of sharing either. So um, anyway, I think it's May 17th. And so just kind of put that out there and, and don't worry, I won't let you forget when that day is. We'll keep talking about it every single meeting between now and then. So for all of, for Zohar and Alan and I, we need to know from you, is it really beneficial? Did you really like meeting in person? Yes. Because for us, and just raise your hand, for us, it's so much more work. And so we want to make sure that, you know, it's something that people value. So if you really liked the in-person meeting, could you just raise your hand? No, oh, never mind. <laughs> that was hands down um, uh, a positive response. Okay, so then this worked pretty well. And I'd like everybody in this room to extend our gratitude to our captioner who captioned for us today. And as you can see, the captions must have been fabulous um, in the state of California for paying for it. And please know that you can contact me at any time. I will do anything within my power to assist you or direct you to somebody who may be able to assist you. And please take any of our literature, including one of our paddles that we have left from the convention that of course I afforded, and we'll see you next month. Available to purchase. Um, so didn't you get the meeting announcement?